Welcome back to The Urban Monk. Dr. Pedram Shojai here with a special treat for you today. I have James Tierney, who's a professor at Harvard, uh, and he is the go-to guy for state's attorney general. He was, uh, uh, back in the 90s, he was the uh, state attorney general of Maine, and uh, there's been so much happening in politics. Uh, even before this political climate, uh, there was the political climate with Obama, where you know the, the state's rights versus federal rights became became a really big thing. And Texas really stood up to uh, the Obama administration. And now you have California and all sorts of other things standing up to uh, the Trump administration. And it's really bringing back a lot of these conversations that you know were, were happening at the inception of the Union of America. And uh, there's a lot I didn't know about this. And there's a lot I'm assuming uh, we're going to glean and gather from our conversation about what states' rights are and what a state's attorney general can do. So. Welcome, welcome to the show. I'm really honored to have you here. Great, happy to be here. <laughs> so you're you're kind of the hub for anyone who wants to be an attorney general, really uh, on the state level, coming through. You're you're parked up at Harvard, uh, and these individuals come through to consult with you to say, hey, what you know, what is this? How do, you know, what do I do for my job? I, I wish I wish it was that formal. I'm I'm a, I'm a, I'm a I, I'm a lecturer at Harvard Law School and have been for the last five or six years. I was at Columbia before then. But uh, the AGs are really a pretty small club, if you think about it. If you got them all in the room, and you never do, you've only got 50, mm. so you could probably fit them in your studio, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's not that formalized. There are some formal organizations. There's the National Association of Attorneys General, the Conference of Western Attorneys General, the Republican AGs Association, the Democratic AGs Association. I kind of float through all of these, and uh, often lecture, speak, or talk, in a lot of phone calls, a lot of texts. Um, that's kind of what I do. Got it. And you've and you've been across the board talking to uh, guys on uh, the red side and the blue side of, of the aisle. And so if you're an AG, uh, either way, you got to do your job right. So you need to figure out what what that. Well, yeah, but I, I'm I'm a pretty blue guy. Okay, I mean I always have been. I've been a Democrat, and and but up until uh, frankly November 9th, uh, I didn't have anything to do with the. I, I mean, didn't I do any formal work with the Democratic AGs Association? But I think the philosophical shift that President Trump is bringing to the country is has pretty much forced me to return to my Democratic roots. So I, I, I'm very fond of several Republican AGs, but most of the work I'm doing now is with the Democratic AGs. Got it. So you had to draw your sword, get back out on the battlefield uh, I here. mean, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, what are you going to do, right? You know, Donald Trump's president of the United States. I, I can't, can't, like, believe that. I, I'm in, I know I'm in good company when I say that, like everybody. But the point is, uh, that's where we are. Not everybody, but you, you take my sure. point. So I do work. I don't want to have any illusions here. Uh, that I'm somehow an arbitrator and working with everybody. I really am focusing on the Democratic AGs, and that's where all the energy is now. Yeah. Uh, the Republican AGs, you know, you get a lot of eye rolls from them. I mean, they're not thrilled with a lot of the things the president's doing, but I think they're in a pretty difficult position to be able to do much about it. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 what once once you pull the banner and you kind of you know pledge allegiance to one of these colors, uh, then it's just towing party line it, and all kinds it, of stuff. No, you know, it, did, it really didn't used to be that way. You know, when the states lined up to sue Microsoft, for example, it was about half Democrat and half Republicans. Um, I mean, this this partisanship that has come in is a direct result of Citizens United. There's no question about it. Uh, you know, millions and millions of dollars now flow into state attorneys general races and. And they don't come, you know, without not anything illegal strings attached. But, you know, your friends give you money and your enemies, you know, try to beat you. So it, there, there is a coarsening of the environment, even among the attorneys general. It's nowhere near as bad as the Congress or the Senate. There's still a lot of personal friendships across party lines, but it is no question much harder than it was 10 years ago. So why is it a big deal? What can a state attorney general do to exercise power for the state uh, when federal laws, federal edicts are starting to encroach, come over and uh, you know, tell, tell us what to do wow. at home? Fabulous question. Uh, I gotta you know, put my Professor's head Put, on putting second. you to work, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I want to, I want to do it right. Yep. Um, here's what happened: when our country was founded, we obviously was founded based on the, the colonial experience, and even there, they had attorneys general who were separate from the crown. Uh, you know, the colonial governor in Virginia didn't get to appoint the attorney general. The attorney general was appointed directly by other places, and the United States, when we became a, a government, we, we rejected the federal model. I mean, in our first constitution, 1787, the president appoints and can remove the federal U.S. attorney, I mean, the United States attorney. 
And, and that's not true of the states. The states, 43 of them are elected, and, and all but two, uh, Alaska and Wyoming, are independent from the governor. So they, they're meant to be independent voices so that they can provide a check on executive power. Now, most of the time, the check they show on executive power is within their state against their own governor. In other words, if the governor or the legislature goes too far, gets over their skis, then the attorney general pushes back. It's not like the normal attorney-client relationship. Mm. But in our federal system, the state AGs are a natural force to say, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Federal government, you're breaking the Constitution. Somebody has to stand up and say no. And that is what attorneys general do. Um, you know, they did it one way during the Obama years. They're doing it another way now during the Trump years. But that is a core function of what an attorney general does to enforce the separation of powers, to enforce the boundaries of federalism. We recently just had this issue with the immigration ban, and right. uh, then uh, there has been legislation that's shown up and kind of blocked it. At this point, who knows what you know? Who knows what the hell is happening? It's all you know, fluid. How much yeah. did the attorney general? Uh, uh, behind the scenes get involved when when there was this kind of overreach, uh, you know, by, say, the federal, the executive branch. Okay, great. L l there's a little history here. The, the, the Republican attorneys general during the Obama years believed that President Obama and the Congress overstepped their constitutional responsibilities. And so they brought a couple, a lot of lawsuits, but the two of the best known, one was to block the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, went to the U.S. Supreme Court a couple times. And the other was to block some of the president's immigration orders, executive orders, which is more relevant to what we're dealing here. So these were the Republican AGs getting together and saying, President Obama, you've gone too far. And they had some luck. They, 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 they almost stopped the Affordable Care Act, and they succeeded in stopping uh, the president's executive order on, on uh, immigration. So that's the history. So everybody wakes up. It's November 9th. We have a new president. Um, and uh, so the Democratic AGs go, wait a minute, uh, this is a guy who uh, has a pretty, he's pretty self-confident. He's, he's going to think he's going to do a lot of things, and he may, in doing that, roll over the states, may try to roll over the Constitution. So by the time the president was sworn in, uh, the Democratic AGs had already met and talked and were strategizing and were watching very, very closely. So the immigration executive order fits into that context. Uh, mm -hmm. I hate to be too preachy and luxury here, but that's the truth of it. Um, it happened to be immigration, but it could have been any number of other issues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then there was a there was a uh, vehicle that the Republicans had really uh, kind of incubated during the Obama years that then the right. Democratic AG said, hey, wait a minute, so now it's our turn, let's fight fire with fire. Sort of. I mean, if you really want to get picky about it, it actually goes back to the Bush years, when the Democratic AG sued over sued the Environmental Protection Agency, the name of the case was Massachusetts versus EPA, which established the rights of state attorneys general to do this. President Obama came in; he loved state attorneys general. He, he they loved him, and so it all went away for eight years except on the Democratic side. But it came back on the Republican side, as I mentioned earlier. And now it's back on the Democratic side. So it's been kicking around at least 20, 25 years. Let's talk about the essence of states' rights and what that means. I mean, because, because right. you know, this union came together. It's still it's called the United States of America. Right. And each of these states are kind of their own entities. And if you're, and if you're Texas, you think you're your own country, right? Like, I mean, they mm -hmm. have identities. Yeah. They have their own laws. They have their own right. states' constitutions. So let's talk about yeah. this historically a little bit. Sure. Uh, your... You, when you were running the, the, the AG office in Maine, right. Maine has its own thing. You know, Maine's been there for a long time. And so there are yeah. certain things that Maine wants for Maine and the, the feds would be overreaching, right? right? And so right. at what point do you step in when there's, an, when there's an egregious breach of some sort of federal overreach mm -hmm. or when there's some sort of state agenda that is, is being challenged? Like at what point do you get tagged in uh, for this stuff? That, that, that's a great, for, first of all, there's more happening on any given day than any attorney general and his or her staff, no matter how talented, can possibly handle. Mm. So at the very beginning, you're picking and choosing. And the second thing you do is you don't, you don't want to fight. If you're the attorney general, you don't, you don't want to go pick a fight with the federal government. Why do you want to do that? Mm. Right? You've got other things to do. You've got crime to prosecute, state institutions to run, consumers to protect. Who wants to go pick a fight, right? Mm. So it's not like you line up and say, I can't wait. Mm. Um, so instead, you sit and you wait, and you look at something that really impacts directly on your state. And then you sit there and say, okay, am I alone? 
Is it just Maine? Uh, chances are not. Chances are, given the way our country works, the way the economy is integrated, you're going to say, wait, 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 wait. Let me check with some of the other AGs. And it's, it's kind of a club. Right. See if anybody's similarly situated. Uh, because these cases based on the federal constitution. It's rare as it really based on some unique aspect of the main constitution. Mm -hmm. It's usually based on our federal constitution, which means all of the states are going to be in the same boat. So you start to send out your emails and your texts and do your Skypes and, and find out what your colleagues think, usually on a staff level to begin with, and say, hey, are you interested in this one? Is this something that impacts you or is it just us? And they say, ah, we're going to run with this one. We won't run with that. This that one's too small. This one's really big. This one's really important. And then pretty soon you start to coalesce around particular issues. These not just constitutional issues that also involve, for example, a, uh, you know, uh, any major uh, consumer case or antitrust case or something like that. Same sort of practice occurs. So the AGs are really connected. I, I have a, I have a little twenty-minute TED talk on my website, stateag.org, AG one hundred and one. Mm -hmm. If you go to that, I kind of drone on for about fifteen, twenty minutes to try to lay out how the offices are structured and how they relate to each other or not. What is what's coming? So you, you know something comes up and you're like, hey, okay, this pisses me off. Who else would this piss off? Let me yeah. text. Let me text my friends. Yeah. It's a, it's yeah. a small club, right? Yeah. And then you say, okay, we, we're get, we're galvanizing. We got a base. We got you know nine states. I like states. to think it's a little more formal than that, but that's the truth. I'm not <laughs> telling you what happened. I, I could say, oh no, it's a great constitutional scholars gathered together in, in a library with lots of books, but that ain't how it works, right? You pick up your phone and you go, hey, you know. That's it. Well, listen. Hey, I'm, I'm from Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. How are you? I'm good. I, well, hey, did you see this? You know, thing that Trump just did. It's more like I, I got to tell you, it is like that. And there are real constitutional scholars in these AG offices. I mean, there are some fabulous, fabulous attorneys. And um, but so it has to happen in both. They aren't like congressmen. It's not like they're just voting. Hey, I don't like that. Right. Hmm. That's not what the attorney general does. Attorney general, the the boss, the man or the woman who's running the show. They have the instincts, they're the elected officials, but they put together really talented staffs and, who have their own expertise. So you say, mm. ah, I'm going to run this by my environmental people, or I'm going to run this by my consumer people, mm. see what they think. Uh, they've been here for 20 years. I've only been AG for 20 minutes. Right. And so they work and they talk and certain issues emerge and then patterns emerge. And, and naturally, just like in life, you learn to trust some people's judgment as opposed to other people. So. Mm. You know, I'm going to be more apt to follow the AG of this state than I am the AG of that state. Yep, yep, makes perfect sense. It's just people, right? We, yeah. we live in an era where you know, if the president is tweeting at three in the yeah. morning, you, you know, know, one of the things I'm shocked at, you know, when I, I, you know, I bring an attorney general into my class, you know, once a semester, and I realize that my students are for the first time actually sitting in a room with an elected official, asking them whatever they want. Now, I've lived my whole life this way. Plus, I'm in a small state. You know, you want to go mm. visit the governor of Maine, you know, you call him up and he says, come on up, right? It's a small state. Mm. But when you're dealing with students from around the country, that was a shock to me because it's so common for me to, you know, bump into an AG and say, hey, did you, you know, did you get those new hearing aids you were talking about? Right? I mean, that's the kind of <laughs> way I do it. Whereas, whereas my students are like, wow. And that's when I realized because so much is done, at, oh, you know, we're doing it on computer, we're doing it on TV, we're only getting images of, and this is both parties, right? Um, so that's the kind of, uh, kind of experience my students have. So it is people. These are real people, and they're doing the best they can with the information they have. And oftentimes the information isn't complete, but you have to make a decision, right? You can't wait till. You know, you get 99% sure. You may have to go when you're 60% sure. See what happens. So you got students at Harvard Law School that are right. kind of uh, gaga over having access for the first time to an elected well, official. Well, yeah, they but, wouldn't use that word, but they, yeah, they're excited. Sure, about it. they're excited. So, yeah. but, but your average person, okay, so if I'm at Harvard Law and I understand the system a little bit more than, than most, um, I'm still getting a little starstruck when I have a, a high level of, like, you know, official that's elected in there. What is your average person feel like that? I mean, I just feel like the guy on the yeah. street feels like he has no access to an well, elected official. I get it. And, and in many cases, they're right. I mean, it, 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 and this comes back again to Citizens United. You know, there are only so many hours in a day, right? So if you're a citizen of California, uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, your, your attorney general, just like your senator and your governor, spends so much time raising money and, and then trying to do their job, that's a little bit hard to, you know, 
take your kids and go to the movies and bump into you in the line and say, you know, what'd you think of La La Land? Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to run into them in the normal course of events uh, increasingly. So, and and that's obviously a terrible, was not thought about in the Constitution. If you read the memoirs or the histories of any of our founding fathers, and they were pretty much all men, you found they're pretty accessible. Mm. Uh, John Quincy Adams, the President of the United States, he used to go for walks by himself up and down the streets of Washington and go swimming in the Potomac every morning. Uh, you know, you want to go see the President, you say, hey. But, you know, that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, well, yeah, the, the scale at which this thing blew up and became, a, you know, a, hundreds of millions of people and, yeah, yeah, the, world, the world's a different place. And- well, now we're, now we're talking about President Trump. Now, President Trump clearly does not understand that his words have meaning. Mm. I mean, I really believe that. He... Mm. he just gets up and talks, uh, says wildly inconsistent things, uh, makes, you know, I mean, no one, no matter, even if you love the guy, can actually think that he's telling you stuff that's true in, in press conferences. Oh, yeah, somebody gave me that. Or I saw it on TV. So, right. So you get that kind of stuff. Uh, this deluge of words is really off putting to people who are trying, in both parties, who are trying to make serious government policy. So, so how, how much of that? We got, big, we got a big problem. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about that. You know, this yeah. this guy comes in writing in, and, and I, you know, I'll, I'll be frank about my personal bias. Uh, you know, yeah. I you know I sit right in between red and blue on, on most issues and all this yeah. kind of stuff. I never liked Donald Trump from the Apprentice days. I just thought he was a narcissistic asshole. So, you know, for, for, for me, it's like you know, I don't care. This isn't a red or blue thing. It's just this guy's yeah. an egomaniac, and that right. that's a challenge, right? So now this guy comes in saying, I want to drain the swamp. And you're, you know, you're a guy that's that sat, you know, in an elected position. You've been serving. You've yeah. been working your ass off trying to, you know, serve your country and help up, uphold the Constitution and all these types yeah. of things. How do you work with a person like that? Um, and how are your colleagues looking to work with a person like that who now is, you know, the commander in chief? Well, first of all, the contrast is stunning, especially from his immediate predecessor. And again, this is without regard to political party. I mean. You know, uh, uh, President Obama taught constitutional law at the University of Chicago Law School. I mean, we're, we're talking to President Harvard Law Review. We're talking, whether you like him or not, we're talking about one smart guy, right? right. So if you're a lawyer and you're talking constitutional principles, he's going to say, oh, I, I want a memo on that. I really need to understand that. Oh, that's interesting. And make sure there's, you know, you're giving me some attached articles and maybe a law review that I can really study. That he, because that's, that was President Obama. Now, whether you liked him or not, that was his way of working, right? He read constantly, you know, he'd zip through, but he read fiction for heaven's sake. So now we're completely turned around and we've got someone who clearly doesn't read anything. Um, He's too busy writing. Uh, yeah, I, we, I, I really don't know what he does at this time, except pretty clearly watch television. So how do you even begin to communicate with that? And I'm not talking about the Democratic AGs here. I'm talking about his chief of staff, right? I'm talking about how do we get him to slow down and say, look, this is an important, you know, you're going to have an executive order. You want to keep people out. We have, a, we have constitutional principles and we have to, you know, obey them and all that kind of stuff. He just pops this thing out. Then he sends, you know, some little, you know, prepubescent guy, this Miller guy gets on television and says, says, oh, the, uh, you know, the Constitution doesn't apply. Nobody can restrict the president of the United States. The judges can't tell the president of the United States what to do. So now you're sitting here going, whoa, wait a minute now. And this includes an attorney general, any attorney general, Republican or Democrat. This thing, wait a minute, what did he say? He said that the president's actions are not reviewable by the courts. So, I mean, even Mitch McConnell, the you know, majority leader in the Senate, gets up and says, no, that's not true. Uh, you know, we don't live in a country where you can just do anything you want. So right now, you know, we're sitting here on, you know, February 17th when I'm in a, taping this, 2017. I know when you say these things, they're out there for eternity. So that's why I put the date on there. Um, we just don't know what's going to happen. So the attorneys general, and particularly the Democratic attorneys general there, are watching for the, for the really unconstitutional abuses. They know that he won and the Democrats lost. They get that. They know that President Trump and his administration get to do a lot of things that Democratic AGs wouldn't do. But the Democratic AGs aren't going to go out and challenge all of that. They say, he won, we lost. No, maybe we'll win next time. That's democracy. That's our system. But when he goes over the edge, when he violates our Constitution, when he takes away people's due process, um, then then we still are a country of laws and the president is not above the law. It's pretty simple. 
Well, and that's that's really the governing principle of you know everything that we agree on here. Like you know, if we're on a two-lane highway, I'm agreeing to stay on my side of that right. left lane, or we're going to crash, and there's, it's going to be a bad day, yeah. right? It's good for everybody. Right? It, it's good for everyone to stay in your lane, kind of thing. And so right. when when we're talking about checks and balances, we have the the branches. And again, I'm not a, a, a law guy, but you know, there's there's Congress, there's the judiciary, and then there's right. the executive branch, and they're right. there as a system of checks and balances. So that's that's right. one. And now you're that's on, within the federal government, and then we have states out there as kind of being a check on the whole federal government because even if the whole federal government agrees the states have certain rights under our constitution to say well now wait a minute i know you want to do that federal government but we're not going to let you do it and how effectively can they galvanize their base of other states or stand on their own and and win that in the supreme court like where, where does that happen well you try not to go to court i mean we right. you know you know what we do we like to cover the fight Right? Reporters like to cover the mm. fight. We like to see somebody with a bloody nose and we all run to the television set or the computer screen, whatever it is, right? Um, so we oftentimes don't get on top of these issues until there's blood on the floor. Um, what AGs try to do, what I try to do, which I hope every citizen tries to do, is say, no, let's, let's not get to that point. Let's find areas where there's mutual, mutual agreement, right? Um, everyone's against terrorism. You know, nobody wants to have violence in our country. You know, what are the actual numbers? What's the data? Where are the most likely perpetrators? How do we do good policing? How do we, I mean, this is sophisticated and it's hard work. That's where we want to be. Mm. But when it all falls apart, if someone tries to short circuit that system, which I think President Trump is doing, he, he, you know, he's a, he's a data free guy, right? He doesn't like, you know, he's not up there late at night scouring the reports, trying to find out what's happening. He's, he's watching television. So what happens here is that um, uh, he's not paying attention to the details. Even I'm sure that his own staff is giving him. I'm sure his staff is saying, you know, Mr. President, we do not have the highest murder rate in the, in the history of the United States. Quite the contrary, right? Uh, and he just doesn't pay attention to that. So we've got a problem. And when, he, when it's just talk, we just let him talk, right? You need to let him talk. But when he's actually starting to try to implement programs without going through processes, such as with an executive order, he doesn't go to the Congress. He doesn't even talk to the Department of Justice. He doesn't talk to the Department of State. He just goes out there and does this stuff. Then, um, then we have a Constitution. Somebody's got to step up. And it looks like it's the Attorneys General. I mean, the Democratic Attorneys General, the thin blue line here. They, they, they're, they're not deep in numbers, but they've got a lot of talent and they have a lot of jurisdiction. What's the split on the 50 states between blue and red on the AGs? Well, the, the, the Republicans have the, have, I think they have the, have the edge now. I think it's maybe they have 28 or 29, something like that. Depends on how you count it. Um, but, it's, you know, I get a lot of those questions and it's kind of really irrelevant because, you know, if 15 states are going to sue you, you have to pay attention to them, uh, even if they're all Democrat or all Republicans. So, you know. Got it. You know, the numbers aren't that important. And the big state, you know, your big state, big state of Texas is very conservative Republican. But, uh, you know, California, Illinois, New York, Pennsylvania, they're all Democrats. So what happens with the big state of Texas when Trump makes some sort of far reaching edict that then, despite, you know, color affiliations, starts to impede on their state's rights? At, at what point does this, you know, end up becoming a Texas fight as well? Well, that's, you know, it really, and here's, here's what we were talking earlier, that this is really about people. I mean, mm. you know, the Attorney General of Texas gets to decide, mm. okay? One of the reasons the Attorneys General are different is that they actually decide, okay? I mean, I mean um, you know, former Attorney General, former Secretary of Interior, former U.S. Senator Ken Salazar from Colorado was once asked, you know, when he was a U.S. Senator, he said, well, you're a Senator now, what do you miss about being Attorney General? And he said, the power. <laughs> right. Right. You're attorney general, you get to decide things, mm. right? You're a senator, you say, well, you know, do I have the votes, you know, 52, 48, 53, 47, can we amend? That's the way, and that's okay, that's what legislature, I used to be a legislator, that's what legislators do. But when you're the attorney general, man, you, you, you take the file home and you read it, and, you know, two-thirds of your staff wants you to do one thing, another third of your staff wants to do something else, you've got to decide. But the buck stops that, with you. You just, you just got to do it, okay? Mm. Even governors, 
don't, in some situations they have that power, obviously, a commutation of a sentence. But in most cases, governors have to work with legislatures and budgets and their administration. Attorney General is oftentimes out there by himself or herself. And that's one of the reasons why traditionally there's been a lot of bipartisan respect across geographic and, and party lines because, um, you know, because there is a lot of affection because they share this decision-making duty. Um, if you wander in, right, even now in this measure of tension, if you walk into a meeting of attorneys general, you'd know right away. You couldn't tell who were the Republicans and Democrats. Everybody, they'd be chatting, they'd be talking about their kids. I mean, you don't see that kind of partisanship. And you'd also get the sense that these were people who really want to do stuff. It's not like a bunch of lieutenant governors, okay? I mean, these people really, you know, they really have responsibilities. And you can see it in their faces and, and in the way they behave. Uh, I, I'm a huge fan of the institution of attorney general and the men and women who fill it. Uh, I was honored to do it, but I've watched a lot of great, wonderful people come through. So it makes a difference. So I, I'd like to dig into this, and you know, the, we're we're getting a little um, I into the the mud here, but I, I got to know. So you sure. know, when when we we had a, a mayor in last week talking about you know just kind of, kind of how shitty it is sometimes right. getting into the politics of the city and how many you know special interests and oh. how money runs the show and yeah, all yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, it's so, tough being a mayor. Yeah, it's tough being a mayor, and, and allegedly... But you, get, but you get to go to the fires, right? Don't you get to, like, ride around the fire truck? Yeah, you, mean, well, you get to cut ribbons. That I mean, there's, there's, there's perks. That's got to be fun. And I always thought the best thing about being governor would be getting in a helicopter and looking at the floods. You know, those guys <laughs> love that. You yeah. never know this. They put on their jacket, and they say, they say, what was the flood like? They say, well, it was a really bad flood. Mm, mm. You know, and that, that's the fun part. Other than that, it's... Pretty tough job. It's a lot of work. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot of work. So, so my question about you know, so when we're talking about a flood, you know, we're talking about a swamp, yeah. a big, big swamp. swamp that's being called out right now. And right. and you know, for for good or for bad, you know, people have lost faith in the political process, right? You know, right. there's a lot of money, there's a lot of lobbyists, you know, there's there's just a lot of bullshit in this space. And you know, people are in some ways really justified in being angry. In some ways, yeah. I think it might be a little hyperbolic what's being said. So, in your opinion, right, what what is working and what is broken? And I know it's a big question. Well, everywhere. Well, just just or, in just in, or in the, my little AG corner. No, everywhere, because in your AG corner, I yeah. think it's I think it's uh, okay. you know pretty well. I, I think I, I think I do have an answer to this. Uh, I think after World War II, we really felt that we were a connected country. We were about 180 million people. Um, we had lots of different ethnic groups, lots of different languages, but we felt connected. We'd gone through this great experience, and we didn't have a lot of international competition. What we sold, uh, what we made, we sold in the country, and so you could you could give more money to workers and pass the prices on and costs. And, and well, now we're not 180 million. Now we're 300 plus, 320 million people, and we speak all these different languages. And every single item that we purchase has been made, oftentimes in many different countries, different component parts. And and so, and that technology which allows us to talk today also drives us apart. It allows us to just to talk to people we agree with. So we don't, we're not members of unions, we don't go to church very much, we, we don't know our neighbors. Um, and so as a result, when you don't know somebody, you can be pretty mean to them. Mm. You can be pretty harsh. You use stereotypes to get through the day because you have, you have no other way to understand what that person might be like. So when you're operating with stereotypes and people don't know, that means you can be mean. And so that allows people, and we've always had people like Donald Trump, who've been willing to come in and play the nationalist card, make you afraid. Make you afraid. Afraid is a much stronger passion than hope. If you're afraid, you're locking your door and, and, and you're afraid to go out nights. And, and or you're afraid of odd days. And so y you look with suspicion around you and say, well, I guess I'll work home today. And you can now because we have the technology. So it's like um, with that sort of function, it, it, it exposes not just the United States, but the whole world to the possibility of, of um, you know, of, uh, of this sort of thing, this kind of vulnerability. So you have, you know, you have, Brexit, you know, England doesn't trust anybody. You have Le Pen in France. Uh, you have the rise of real nationalism in places like Hungary and Poland. Um, it's, it's a dangerous time, and the United States fell prey to this. And, and with Donald Trump running around saying Brexit's good, I, I I'm not sure he could spell Brexit, much to understand. It's a very complicated issue. But he's running around telling the world Brexit is good. And so England should pull out of that European Union. He has no idea what he's talking about. 
So, but he says it, and so that voice of nationalism and negativity and attacks makes people afraid, and so you clutch. I, well, I'm afraid, I clutch, right? I, mm -hmm. I clutch, you, can, you know, you get body language, you, 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 you freeze up, and that's, that's not a good way to run the country, it's not a good way to run the government. Some would say sorry, for, sorry for the little, 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 you know, oration here, but it's, it's so, if you got a mayor on, he's dealing with that every day. Yeah. And so people are less willing to make sacrifices for someone else if you don't know them. If I know somebody, I'll sacrifice. I'll pay a little more taxes so, you know, those kids can have a better school. But if you don't have any kids or you don't know anybody whose kids are in the school, uh, you know, you've pulled your kids out of the school or something, then you're going to be less tolerant. There's going to be less taxes. The schools get worse. People get angrier. There you go. We're, yeah. we're in trouble. How much of this is a pendulum swing? I mean, we've seen this happen in American history. We've seen this happen in world history a lot. And sometimes it, you know, sometimes it looks like Nazism, right? Other times we've had, you know, isolationist kind of right. eras in America. Ultra. Yeah. Where do you where do you think this one is? This one particularly loud and dangerous? And for well, there are a couple things that are that are different with this one. I mean, let's hope, right? One is the technology is is it does have the capacity to drive us apart, but it clearly has the capacity to bring us together, uh, and so. If people could start speaking in terms of broad themes, themes that 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 sort of bring us together, uh, this presidential campaign, uh, Secretary Clinton's campaign was very often saying Donald Trump's a bad man. Don't vote for him. All negative. Donald Trump's campaign was, you know, everybody's out to get us. You know, the don't trust anything you read anywhere. So it was all very negative. So the idea of finding people who can, men and women of either party, who can kind of broach that is you know pretty high priority um, another thing we haven't had before is this is this supreme court decision that says you can give political money unlimited political money so we have individuals who um you know are just pouring money in with hedge funds that have no feeling of responsibility just pouring money in um and there's some pushback on that we're seeing some people some very wealthy people saying we have to do better and try to bring people together but uh, you know, hey, I'm an optimist. If I wasn't mm -hmm. an optimist, we wouldn't be having this phone call, right? That's right. I, I'd be living in a cabin up in Maine and, and uh, you know, doing going ice fishing or something. So uh, I'm an optimist. You sure. Know. Well, I, it, I, you know, I love my family. I and I hang out with my friends I went to high school with, and you know, I see. You know, I'm not sitting around preaching to people. Yeah, well, that's yeah. really it. I mean, either you're going to you know, roll over and die or you're going to defend you yeah. know, the, the, the world that you love so much. And, and, so, and there's so much, right? And, and I would say people on both sides of the political spectrum, I mean, look, they, they, they want a better life. I mean, every, the commonalities sure. there are great. Uh, it's just the, this kind of polarizing discourse, which is, is very challenging at this point. Yeah, well, let, let me give you an example. We used to have people, when I was a young legislator and I was knocking on doors 40 years ago, people would say, Oh, you know, so-and-so is cheating on welfare. And I say, great, let's turn them in. And they go, well, no, you know, so-and-so, you know, her husband was no good. I knew him. I went to high school with him, and he left. And so she's really, yeah, she's cheating sort of. But, you know, if we turn her in, she's not going to get any money for the kids. And in other words, there was a sense, even when somebody did something wrong and cheating on welfare is wrong, there was a sense of connectedness. Well, today, you don't know your neighbor. Mm -hmm. You didn't go to high school with, you know, her ex-husband. You don't know any of these things. Mm -hmm. And so it's easier to be harsh and to be negative and think that when somebody else is doing well, they're taking it away from you, which mm -hmm. isn't true. We all do better when everybody's sharing. But in the individual case, you say, oh, they're getting that. You know, I, I'm not. Mm -hmm. uh, they must have gotten some secret deal. Uh, you know, then we're in trouble. And then, of course, if you put a brown face on it or a black face on it or an Asian face on it, uh, you know, right now, and you throw the immigrant, you play the immigrant card, and um, man, we're then we then we're in trouble because you yeah. can objectify people who don't look like you. You can turn them into the other, and 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 then that opens up the avenue for this kind of xenophobia and the anger and the punishing rhetoric, which comes at you day after day after day. And in this case, from the president of the United States. So it's it's we, we got a problem here. Yeah. Uh, but we're working on it. I yeah. mean, I work with great people every day. We're working on it. So you have a National Association of Attorneys Generals meeting coming up uh, in a right. few days. Yeah. Uh, what is going to be the big talk at this meeting? Like, what do you, is there an agenda uh, around well, all this? Oh, there's always an agenda. Sure. There's, there's like 20 agendas, right? right. So the, the NAG is a, is a wonderful organization. It's got fabulous staff. And they have a great staff set. They're talking about all kinds of issues. Uh, some, some appear on their face to be conservative. Some appear on their face to be 
liberal and, and there are some wonderful speakers. So there's that agenda. Then there's the agenda kind of in the room and then there's the agenda out in the hallway. That's where I am, hmm. uh, where people are coming up and say, Jim, you know, I don't know, have you ever heard of this one before? And what about that? And that, you know, that's kind of where I do my work. Mm -hmm. um, there used to be, when I was a kid AG, a long time ago, there'd be, you know, late night meetings and alcohol and stuff. That's all gone. These people are professionals. Uh, I was at a NAG meeting, I don't know, the winter NAG, in December, and I said, look, we got to get together and talk about something at like 11 o'clock. And everybody said, oh, that's too late. You know, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. So I had to force them to go. And they said, oh, all right. So, I mean, it's not like, I don't want people watching this to think there's a lot of parties and lobbyists and cash flowing around. That just doesn't, doesn't happen. Um, these are hardworking people. So I don't know if I answered your question. So mm. there's like three different agendas. So is immigration going to be discussed? Of course. Is the Affordable Care Act going to be discussed? Of course. Is education going to be discussed? Of course. Is criminal justice reform going to be discussed? Of course. Is it going to be on the formal agenda? I don't know. Right. Right. right, but you're going to talk about what's what's up and trending. This is this is a club. These are people that are going to talk about what's right in front of them, and who knows what the president's going to do tomorrow? Who knows right. what he did while we're having this conversation? That could be the primary subject. I don't know. What yeah, he's going to yeah, do. fair, fair enough. If his press secretary doesn't know what he's going to do, his vice president's been cut out of the loop. Nobody knows. So we, we don't know where we're going to be. Yeah, what a, what an interesting time. What is, is is there a threat of encroachment? You said, okay, there's no parties, there's no lobbyists at this party yet. Um, and now as we're starting to understand these systems of checks and balances as they kind of trickle downstream into states' yeah. rights and places where people can kind of have oppositional bases, yeah. how much, you know, you're saying there's more money starting to flow into this thing. What, what What's right. the threat of dirty kind of lobby money coming into oh, your AG world? I, I, frankly, the Supreme Court's legalized everything. I don't know why anybody they wouldn't bother with dirty money. I mean, mm. just, I mean, you do anything; it's all legal, right? Right. You can you can contribute anonymously, and why you know why? No, it's not dirty. I mean, people aren't, at least in my world, the attorneys general are not sitting around making money themselves. That that, that, that doesn't happen. I I've ne I, you know I just don't see that. Um, but there's money going into elections now. So oh, a lot of money going into elections. Yeah. So it's certainly not lobby free. I do think both sides have some have, have some challenges. I'd like, I'd like to use this opportunity to throw out a challenge to my side, the left side, if you will. I'm a pretty liberal guy, personally. Um, uh, they are not doing a good job prioritizing anything. You come in and say, they'll say, oh, I want to talk to the AG. They should sue Trump over this and that and this and that. And I go, well, wait a minute. What do you think is the most important? Hmm. And they look at each other and they say, no, this and that and this. And hmm. I said, wait a minute, that's not going to work. First of all, it shouldn't work. If you can't make a, pro if you were some advocacy group for human services or justice reform or, you know, ACLU, whatever you are, if you can't establish your own priorities, how can you expect the attorney general to make priorities? So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty tough on him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it doesn't make me popular, but I'm not running for anything, right? Mm -hmm. So I say, look, you guys have got to go and make some decisions. What is the really big one that you want the AGs to do? And they don't want to hear that because that means they have to make the tough decisions. I said, well, the AGs are going to have to make a tough decision. You better help them. And that's bad. That's bad when everybody wants everything. And there's way, way, way too much of that. No one willing to sacrifice. Mm. Environmentalists say we're more important than the justice reform. People say we're more important than human services. We're more important. It all costs money, right? So where's the money going to come from, right? So you can't, you've got to force prioritization. And the left is very, very bad at this. Mm. Uh, I don't, I, 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 the right's probably pretty bad at it too. Uh, but the left is particularly bad at it. So if I have uh, an AG, how often are these elections? Is it a state-based thing or is it like every two a years? A AGs are elected every four years with the exception, I think, of Vermont still has a two-year term. Uh, but they're every four-year terms, yeah. Okay, and then they run uh, simultaneously with presidential elections? Uh, it depends on the state. Got depends it. On the state. This last year we had elections in Indiana and Missouri, and, uh, but we didn't have them in uh, Ohio or Illinois, so it depends. Got it. Uh, some are in cycle, some are out of the cycle of, with the president. So it seems like a pretty important position. So if I care it about... It sure is. I mean, people are waking up, right? The fundraisers woke up. We, you know, a bunch of us got together and sued the tobacco industry about 20 years ago, something I worked very hard on. And, and that really woke a lot of people up and said, whoa, 
these guys take on the tobacco industry, then they may take on somebody else. So the business community and major donors have figured out that AGs are important a long time ago. But the rest of the world is just waking up. If you try to go to, and you know, I just, I love Harvard Law School. They have a lot of faith in me. I'm a lecturer in law. I run a clinic. I have like 100 students on my wait list. It's, it's a great program. But th there are very, very few law schools, maybe three or four, who run a course on attorneys general because they're all focused on the federal government because mm. the law professors all went to, you know, clerk for federal judges and so on. They're just totally focused on the federal government. So it's important for law schools and for bar associations uh, and, uh, you know, and for legal periodicals to wake up and say, wait, 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 wait. You know, we've got to look at these AGs. They've been around for 200 years. They're not going to go away, mm. you know. Uh, you know, we got to do something about that. Uh, and so stateag.org, my website, also includes my syllabus, which I put up. I want the whole world to read it. There are no secrets. I teach very liberal students and very conservative students every semester. Uh, I call it down the middle. I don't hide my own politics, but I call, call it down the middle. And, I, and I, want I want people to come to my website and say, look, oh, that's interesting. That's how the states deal with outside mm -hmm. counsel. That's how the states deal with governors. That's how the states do civil rights. That's how the states do... Uh, appear before the Supreme Court. This is something I want people to read about. Um, I hope other professors get in and teach the same thing. The more, the better. One of the precepts of uh, the founding fathers, one of the things that they really kind of established this democracy on was an enlightened citizenry. Um, and so people need to know what's up. They need to know, you know how, how the process works, how politics works, so that they can be a part of it. Uh, there's this one, and we're running out of time, but there's one more question that, that you know, keeps sure. coming up. I'm in California, right? And so we're, okay. you know, we're famously blue, and you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a liberal state. And so you know, people are so pissed off about the, the federal <laughs> you know, election and everything that there's been serious talk kind of floating around about saying, well, you know, cessation is an, op is an option, right? So, <laughs> yeah. and, and whether or not it's an actual reality that's, that's even conceivable um, how possible is something like that? I mean, if, if a state gets pissed off enough, can it say, you know, bye bye, I'm packing, you know? I, I, I think we had something called the Civil War that kind of resolved that issue. Well, right. um, you, you just can't like pack up and leave. This is the United States of America. We don't want people to go. We don't want people to go. We want to, you know, we got to figure this out, you know? Um, we, you know, we, we got to get past the foolishness, and there's a lot of foolishness coming out of the president's mouth. You know, three million phony voters came into here. They all this ridiculous stuff. We have to get past it. You, you made the point. We have to be enlightened. Democracy is work. It doesn't come to us easy. You know, we, every generation's got to go out there and win this fight again. And I'm a baby boomer, right? Uh, and but wow, we've got to have every generation. You know, people young and old have got to say this is hard work. We have to really study. We have to prioritize. We have to think about this. We have to be good to each other. We have to be kind to each other. We have to care about each other mm. if this country is going to make it. And no, some state trying to pull out of the unions, California today, and Barack Obama, Texas wants to leave. That's, that's all, as my mother-in-law would say, is just foolishness. Mm -hmm. uh, we gotta, we got to do this thing. Yep. Yeah, I, pre I appreciate that sentiment. I mean, the last thing, you know, la last thing we want is for this great nation to, to start coming apart over differences. So last question here. Sure. Um, you know, you had mentioned that after World War II, we were unified as a people. I mean, there's less Certainly of us, more, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, more, and you know, we'd won the war, the economy was good, everything was good. And it seemed like there was a narrative, uh, whether you agree with it or not, a narrative, kind of a, a, an overarching narrative that was working about what it is to be an American. Um, mm -hmm. And now it seems like meaning and purpose are gone. The world's gotten bigger. Things have gotten more complicated. Right. Uh, how much of this is kind of a, a, a lack of narrative? I mean, so, you know, you could polarize the country and win an election, as we've just witnessed, right? right? Yeah, um, yeah. And, and so that. that's, that's a narrative. It, it, it's not necessarily one that serves you know, the country as a whole. Um, how much of our rebuilding needs to be in kind of discovering a new narrative for America that, that works for everyone, is inclusive, and who the hell can, who the hell can make right. this type of thing happen? Well, well before, before I get to that, let me just say, at the end of World War II, I was talking about there was a narrative, but it sure wasn't good if you were an Afro-American because you couldn't vote. You know, it sure mm. wasn't good if you were a woman because you couldn't get a job. Mm. It sure wasn't good because you were smoking cigarettes that were killing you and your life expectancy was a lot shorter. So I don't want to over romanticize mm -hmm. that time. But there was certainly a sense of connectedness that was, uh, and God help you if you were a gay or lesbian or a transgender person, and, you know, even to the time when I was in high school. I mean, it was very, very difficult. So I don't want to romanticize. But your question is, I think, uh, the answer, we are too used to this country to looking to individuals, you know, saviors to come in, right? So the liberal Democrats say, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, they're going to come in and save us. That's not going to work. 
Those are pretty harsh voices. They're pretty harsh voices. They're pounding on people the same way Donald Trump pounds on people. So I think we have to hide in our narrative, and this could be, I, I do believe, and California has always been the leader, I do believe that this narrative has to come out of a, uh, in a way that is technologically sound because we, you know, we, you know, we can instantly communicate with people. The whole country could be galvanized. And that's, those voices have got to come through. I still turn to music. I still turn to the arts. I still turn to um, uh, not just elected officials, but real leaders. I think we are looking for people who are willing to take risks and not just do the safe things all the time. Um, rise above their own narrow interests and say, look, this country is a great country. We have to get ourselves there. Mm. But boy, this is, a, this is a tough moment to find that theme. I do have some friends who are researching and thinking and trying to do this in an honest way. Um, and uh, I wish them Godspeed. I, I think we have to work on collective things. I think we have to do things together. One of the things I love going back to Maine, I like to go to the high school basketball games. You see everybody turns out. Uh, things like that are important because you actually see people who you may not work with. And the more we do of that, the better. And that's it's not easy, but sometimes we have to get off our couches and just go out there and do it. Amen. And yeah, and okay. Lord knows we're on the couch way too often in this. Oh country. yeah, no question about that. Yeah, okay. uh, James Tierney, Jim, you you are great. I really appreciate Thanks your energy, your your enthusiasm, and the fact that you know you're you're still in the ring. You could you could be ice fishing. I I could. I've gone ice fishing, and uh, it's an experience I just as soon take a pass on right now. But I take your point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. I've enjoyed this. It's been a great conversation. I think we hit some important themes, and hopefully people will jump in and tell me where I'm all wrong, and maybe I'm right a little bit. And it's been great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And t tell us the website one more time for anyone who wants to. Stateag.org. Stateag.org. Stateag you can you can. Learn more about attorneys general than you ever want to know. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you. It's listen. It's your government. It's you know by the people for the people. Only if you're involved. So get get on there. Start learning where you can get more involved. And again, I you know, and I agree very much with what what he's saying. Don't just wait for some hero to ride in and change everything for you. This is this is your world, this is your community, this is your society. So what are you doing to make the world a better place? How are you getting involved and what's your role in this, right? This isn't about someone fixing the world for you. You fix your life, you fix your universe and then it ripples out from there. So get involved. You could still go ice fishing on the side, but get involved. Let me know what you're okay. going to do and I'll see you in the next show. Dr. Pedram Shojai, the Urban Monk. Thanks so much.